Yesterday evening, <coughs> we were looking at this verse that said, we are not ignorant of Satan's schemes. And we looked at how Satan came and tempted Eve, first of all, and the tactics that he adopted there, which are the same today, doubt God's word and doubt God's love. Now today we want to look at another person whom, whose attack by Satan is described in the book of Job in chapter 1. As I said earlier, Job is the first book of the Bible that was written because he lived many years before Moses who wrote Genesis. So when God wrote scripture and the very first book he wrote for man, he wrote about a man of God who was attacked by Satan. And this was written even before Genesis. And it, it's interesting that God in uh, wanting to write a book for man the very first chapter is about a man of God who feared him and hated sin, was attacked by the devil, suffered a lot in his life, but finally came through triumphantly. So that teaches me that God's ultimate desire is to make us overcomers over Satan. He shows us here that how Satan attacks a man of God and how the man of God becomes a much better person at the end of that time. Because many people have this question. Why does God allow Satan to exist? Why doesn't he destroy him? And I think in the book of Job we have an answer that God uses Satan to fulfill a certain purpose. So with that in mind, we'll look at the book of Job. <clears throat> the interesting thing here is that um, here was a man who was not a poor man. He was a very rich man. Now a lot of people think if you're a rich man you can't be spiritual. When God wrote the first book of the Bible, he talks about a rich man who was spiritual. Spirituality has got nothing to do with your income or how many assets you have. This man, it says, was the richest man. And that's the meaning there in verse 3. The richest man in all that eastern part of the world and a man who was highly respected and a man with high position, but also a very God-fearing man, in fact, the one man on earth whom God could point out to. And um, the very first verse describes him like this. Here was a man who was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. And one who was the one man on earth whom God could point out to Satan. Now one would think that such a man would never have any problems. Many people have the idea that if you're a man of God, you don't have any trials or problems. Well, the very first book that God wrote for man, he says the opposite. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, it says in Psalm 34, verse 19. God delivers out of all of them. We read many times in the, in the Gospels how Jesus faced problems. I remember one particular instance where we read um, that Jesus, after feeding the 5,000, he urged the disciples to get into a boat and go across the Sea of Galilee. Now that indicates that they were not too keen on going. But he urged them to go. And when he urged them to go, they ran into a storm. And when I read that, I thought, 
Here were people who were obedient. Do obedient people run into storms? What if they had not obeyed? What if they had disobeyed and said, we're not going. We think we'll stay here on the shore. They wouldn't have faced a storm. So I learned something there. It's those who are disobedient, you usually, usually have a fairly easy time through life. And it's those who are obedient who face storms. So if you're having a fairly easy time through life, you better check up where you stand spiritually. And uh, if you're facing storms, you're probably on the right track. But you need, to, the question is how you react to those storms. That's the point. Storms comes in the, life, in the lives of unbelievers too. But the difference is in our reaction. We are not ignorant of Satan's tactics. We saw yesterday that he came like a serpent. But here we see him coming like a lion. He, we saw yesterday he comes like a serpent or a lion. Here in, in Job's case, he didn't come with deception. He came with a frontal attack on him, his family, his business, his property. There are a number of things we can learn from here. First of all, we see this man was not only a God-fearing man himself, but he had a family also that he had control over. Even after they were married, they respected him. And the proof of that is these, he had ten children. They were all living in their own houses. They were probably grown up and married. And when they had a feast for somebody's birthday, he would call them. He says, hey, I want you folks to come home. And they would come. If you have ten children and they are grown up and married, and when you tell them, come here, I want to pray for all of you. And they come. You can be sure you're being a pretty good father. You've got children who respect you. That's Job. I learned something about Job by just the fact that those children who were married listened to him. They didn't listen to him just when he was small. They were small. After they were independent and away from their father, they listened to him. And he didn't call them home for a feast. He said, I want to call you to pray for you folks, just in case any of you have sinned. Boy, that's really something. And I believe if they became like that, it's because they were brought up like that from childhood, to respect their father and to value spiritual things. Otherwise, they'd have said, forget it. We'll come another day or something like that. He sent and called for them to consecrate them and it says in verse 5 he'd rise up early in the morning and offer burnt offerings for them here's a, a something I see about this man whom Satan attacked Satan attacks a man who's got a godly family because that's a tremendous testimony for God against the devil I'm sure during his when the children were small he must have tried in so many ways to attack this family. Every true servant of God, their families are under attack by Satan. But he didn't succeed because this man knew how to protect his family by prayer. And usually they say the children of rich parents are usually wayward, godless, because they've been spoiled by their parents give them plenty of money and everything they want and Job was the richest man in that country not only the richest man he was a leader and elder it's like a big businessman who's uh, an important person in society and his children were not spoiled that tells me something about him this fear of God and a great example for us who have much more than he had. We have a Bible, we have the Holy Spirit, we have fellowship, we have conferences, we had meetings, he had nothing. As far as I know, there was not another person there who feared God like him. And his prayer was not because his children were living in sin, 
He was concerned about their inner life. There are very few parents who are concerned about the inner life of their children. He says, I'm praying, I want to pray for them because perhaps, just in case, I'm not sure, I don't have any evidence, but you know, when people have a lot of fun together, it could be possible that they have sinned in their hearts. So he's in verse 5, just in case they've sinned and against God in their hearts, I want to pray that God will forgive them. It's an amazing a father's concern for his children long after they have left home, praying that they'll be forgiven in case there was some sin there. All of you who are fathers and mothers learned something from Job there, a man who lived before the old covenant, who didn't have a Bible or the Holy Spirit. And then we read of this time when Satan comes and stands before God. And the Lord asked Satan, where are you coming from? And uh, I mean, the Lord knows all that, but it's written there for our knowledge. Satan said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. The Bible teaches that Satan was cast out of the third heaven, the immediate presence of God. We know that's the immediate presence of God because Paul was caught up to the third heaven. And from there he was cast down to, the first heaven is this universe that we can see. The third heaven is the dwelling place of God, so presumably in between there's a second heaven. And that's where Satan was cast down to. And that's what we read off in Ephesians 6, 12 as the heavenlies. We wrestle with principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Satan and his demons, they're not in hell. Satan has never been in hell. And just by the way, for an accurate understanding of scripture, he will never go to hell. Unbelievers go to hell. The Bible says he was cast down from the third heaven to the second heaven. We read one day when Christ comes back to earth, before Christ comes back to earth, maybe three and a half years before he comes back to the earth, Satan is cast down from the second heaven to the earth. Then he'll be here in the days of the Antichrist. And then when Christ comes back three and a half years later, he'll be cast into the bottomless pit along with all his demons for 1,000 years when Christ will reign on the earth and there won't be any devil or demons around. And then he'll be taken out of that bottomless pit, released for a short while, maybe a few moments, and then he will be cast into the lake of fire. And then hell will be taken and cast into the lake of fire. Hell is like a little pond of fire. It's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. So uh, the devil never goes to hell. He goes from third heaven to second heaven to earth to the bottomless pit and into the lake of fire. So while now when he is in the second heavens, it's good for us to know these things in scripture. While he's in the second heavens, he has permission from God to move around on the earth. And he is roaming about on the earth and walking around on it along with all his demons seeking whom he can attack, whom he can possess. And uh, when he comes back, he sees all the hypocrites on earth, all the people who claim to be very holy. He sees through the lives of all the so-called religious people and certainly I believe Satan's roaming around the earth today. He's roaming around in every country, in every town. I'm sure he's got all his demons and agents going around Loveland here, looking around and people and wherever you come from. And he knows everything about your lives. He knows everything about, the only thing he doesn't know is your thoughts. I mean, the devil's got no access to our thoughts. But everything else about your life, your financial dealings, your secret practices, what you do in the darkness, what you do which nobody else knows, what your husband and wife don't know, he knows everything. Every little detail of every person who calls himself Christian, every preacher, everything else. And he comes back before God and he's got a lot to accuse God, accuse God's people before God. Because it says in another verse in Revelation chapter 12 that when he stands before God, you know the reason why we want to study what Satan does as I was saying yesterday, 
in any type of military warfare, intelligence is a very important factor. Intelligence about the enemy. What does the enemy do? Where are his strengths? How does he attack? Because that helps us to overcome him if we know in advance what his tactics are. And in Revelation 12 it says, Satan has got many titles given there. Verse 9, the serpent, the devil, Satan, great dragon. Verse 9, and then in verse 10, he's called uh, the, he's also called here the deceiver of the whole world in verse 9. That's another title. He's the deceiver of the whole world, but the accuser of believers. Notice that. Deceiver of the whole world, which includes believers as well. But when it comes to accusation, verse 11, verse 10, it's particularly God's children. He's not wasting his time accusing his own children. He, he really deceives them. But the brothers, the believers, it says in verse 10, he's the accuser of the brethren. And that's the place where it says he's thrown down from the second heaven to the earth. Okay. So he comes before God and he accuses every believer whose sin is not cleansed. He cannot accuse, uh, he can accuse you to yourself about a lot of your past sins which have been cleansed and forgiven uh, because he knows that most believers live in tremendous guilt over sins in their past life which even though they have confessed a hundred times they still keep on remembering and get condemnation over. The devil knows that very well. So he keeps on accusing them here on earth. But he cannot accuse you before God about a sin that you have repented of, confessed, and which has been cleansed in the blood of Christ. No. I've committed a lot of sins from my unconverted days. The devil cannot accuse me before God about any one of them because they've all been confessed and cleansed in the blood of Christ. But if there is something in your life which has not been confessed, you can be pretty sure that he accuses you before God even if nobody knows about it. Not in your thoughts, because that he cannot see. With that, your conscience tells you about, but a lot of other things which he knows about your life. Where you look, what you read, what you see, how you handle money, and every little thing. He sees it, he's got his demons, and they have information systems by which he knows everything, and he accuses every believer before God. And you know, believers constitute a very small part of the world's population. He, the others, he just deceives and leaves them, but he's concentrating on believers. He's the accuser of believers. And you can be pretty sure of another thing, that he will not accuse before God anything that's false. He cannot say, for example, Zach went and murdered somebody. He knows it didn't happen. And that, he's not so foolish. He tells lies to us. He's called a liar. But he dare not tell lies to Almighty God. No, he's, he's clever. What he will accuse you of to God, and every believer, if you're a child of God, you can be pretty sure Satan's got his eyes on you. And if you're a God-fearing upright man, he's looking out for little, little things. And he accuses you to, before God concerning things you have done or said or anything about, about you. You know, your attitudes can sometimes be seen on your face. Even lust can be seen on your, in your eyes. Pride can be seen in your face. So he can detect these things. Even though he can't read your thoughts, he can see lust in your eyes. Because he's observed man for years. He can see pride in a person's face. The Bible speaks about uh, preachers in Second Peter who have eyes full of adultery. Who are greedy. Satan can detect that even though he doesn't know a person's thoughts. He sees by his attitudes and actions and he's a good reader of faces. He, can, he knows a lot of things that you're thinking about because it's evident on your face. He can see anxiety, tension and he knows all that's happening in your life. And he accuses you before God about things that are true in your life. Now that teaches us one very important truth. That when you speak about a believer to another person in, an, in a spirit of accusation, 
it's no use justifying yourself saying, but what I'm saying is true. Well, Satan says the same thing. He can say to God, what I'm saying is true. But even though what he's saying is true, he's still called the accuser of the brothers. So even if you report to another person something true about A, B, or C, someone else, and every word you say is absolutely accurate, you could still have the spirit of the accuser. Because it's the motive with which you say it that determines whether you have concern for that person or whether it's gossip and accusation. And in that moment, when you're telling another person about the evils of this other brother and everything you say is proved, in, in fact, believers are not even careful about that. A lot of believers just accuse without knowing all the facts. But even if you say everything that's true, when you are accusing in that way, you must remember that you're holding hands with Satan. And Satan urges you on. Yeah, say it. Don't stop there. Say some more. Haven't you heard that voice? And he can clothe it in pious language. Tell this brother you're only saying it for prayer. It's because you want to pray for that brother. Put a pious coating on it and accuse him and only tell the truth. And you think you're not accusing. You're holding hands with Satan. Now it's true that Satan's got a lot of agents out there among his own children. But it's very sad when he's got agents among God's children. Ask yourself, what have you accomplished by spreading these tales about somebody and some of those things are just what you heard, you don't even know whether it's true, to another person. When Jesus was on earth, it's written about him in Isaiah chapter 11. We saw a little bit of it earlier today. Job was a man who feared God. And it says the spirit of the fear of God was upon Jesus when he was on the earth. Isaiah chapter 11 in verse 2, it says the spirit of the fear of the Lord will be upon him, upon Christ. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And one translation of that verse says, he will, the Holy Spirit will make Jesus quick of scent in the fear of the Lord. Like a dog can pick up a scent. You know, the dog can, you know, these police dogs can smell a thief's, some bit of clothing or something left behind, pick up a scent in a room where he's come in and follow that, can pick up a scent that our noses can never pick up. You come to a fork in the road and the dog will just smell and say, no, this way. And there's nothing you can see. So the Holy Spirit makes us quick of scent in the fear of the Lord. You come to a fork in the road and the Spirit of God will say, this is the way. He may tell you to keep your mouth shut or go this way, go that way. Look here, don't look there. Quick of scent in the fear of the Lord, just like that dog knows which way to go. And therefore, because he's got this tremendous sensitivity to the fear of the Lord, reverence for God, Jesus would never judge by what his eyes see. And he would never make a decision by what his ears hear. As long as we are on this earth, we see so many things, we hear so many things, and uh, we tend to say, I saw it with my own eyes. I heard it with my own ears. Jesus says, no, I, I, I saw things and I heard, but I will not take a decision based on that. I will not judge even because I saw something. There could be other reasons behind it. I don't know. But he would make a judgment with righteousness, verse 4. It's not that he went around the world without any opinions. But whatever came through his eyes and came through his ears would not give him reason for accusation immediately. Very often that's how it is with God's children. The accuser of the brethren is very quick 
to come and put accusative, critical thoughts, particularly about people whom we don't like. And we like to think the worst about somebody and talk about that particularly to other people who we know also don't like him. There's a lot of that. Accusing. And everything you say may be true, but your spirit is not right. Is the accuser of the brethren. Jesus would see these things and hear these things and he would filter it in his mind and in his heart in, the, in reverence for God and he would seek to understand in righteousness what the Holy Spirit wanted to say to him in connection with all that. Then he would form a judgment. One of the most interesting things I see in the life of Jesus was that very early in his life he knew that Judas Iscariot was a crook. He said that in John chapter 6 towards the end, one of you is a devil. But all through those years, he never told anyone who that person was. He never whispered into Peter's ear, by the way, that's Judas Iscariot. He never told anyone. And the proof of that is at the a Last Supper, when Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, everybody didn't turn and look at Judas Iscariot. You know, that really teaches me something. That Jesus never betrayed him. He wasn't a gossiper. He wasn't an accuser. He had nothing to do with the accuser of the brethren. Do you want to be like Jesus? Do you really want to follow him? Do you understand the tactics of Satan? And to such an extent, it's amazing, it really amazes me that all of them are sitting there and they all say, Lord, is it I? They don't say, Lord, is it Judas? They say, Lord, is it I? Why, that's really faithfulness, tremendous faithfulness. And even more than that, I don't know whether you've noticed this. You read in John 13 that, Lord, who is it? John asked him, John 13, 25. And Jesus said, okay, I'll show you who it is. John 13, 26. He dipped a morsel and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. John 13, 26. And as soon as the morsel, he took the morsel. Verse 27, Satan entered into Judas Iscariot. And Jesus, Jesus only said to him, what you want to do, do quickly. Now, and all the disciples thought, or most of them anyway, that because Jesus had the money box, verse 29, that Jesus was telling him some innocent thing like, you know, we need something for the feast. Why don't you go and buy it? or give some money to the poor. That absolutely amazes me. That even when he dipped it and gave it to Judas Iscariot, they still didn't feel that he was accusing him of being the betrayer. How carefully Jesus cleansed, kept himself from anything of even the smell of being the accuser of the brothers. Let God expose him in his own time. I will not. And God did expose him. I find a great lesson there because what we read in, what we read in Revelation 12, 11, if you noticed, 12, 10, if you noticed was he accuses the brothers day and night. He's a full-time worker, 24 hours a day, Seven days a week, his job is accusing, accusing the believers to God. And I want to say, dear brothers and sisters, <clears throat> steer clear of that. Lest you get infected by that spirit. Do you wonder why the devil is able to get inroads into other areas of your life, into your family? Maybe because he got a foot into your door 
through the spirit of accusation. You got to be careful. He can destroy your home, he can destroy your family relationship with your <laughs> husband or wife or and your children. If you don't pull back and say, I'll never allow that accuser come into my mind anymore. Let God do his business of judging. You know, in a court, if you go to a human court, there is a judge, there is an accuser who's called a prosecutor, there is a defender, who's a defense advocate, attorney, and then there are witnesses who are called in. What do you think we are? Judges? No. Prosecutors? Accusers? No. Defenders? Jesus is the advocate. We can cooperate with him. We are witnesses. And if we want to cooperate, we mean to cooperate with the advocate who is defending God's children. Because it says, just like the devil accuses the believers day and night of full-time ministry, we read that Jesus in Hebrews chapter 7 has also got a full-time ministry. Hebrews in chapter 7, read here in verse 25, he always lives the last part of verse 25, to make intercession for his people. Jesus also in a full-time ministry, think of this going on in the heavenlies. A believer sins and immediately Satan is there to accuse and immediately Jesus is there to pray for that child of his. There are two ministries going on in heaven. It says all the time, 24-7. Just like the other ministry, 24-7, hear something, 24-7. Accusation, intercession. Both are seeing the same believer who's fallen. Now here on earth, there are believers who watch that believer doing something wrong. And immediately, some of them are not bothered. But there are others who join one of these two ministries. Accusation or intercession. Most believers that I know <laughs> join hands with the devil. Accusation. And that's where we've got to learn a lesson. Be careful. It says we are not ignorant of Satan's schemes. Don't be ignorant of Satan's schemes. He's the accuser of the brethren. Let's turn to, a book, turn to the book of Zechariah. There's a beautiful picture of this in Zechariah. In Zechariah, the Lord gave Zechariah a vision in chapter Three, Zechariah chapter 3, it says here in verse 1 that the, he saw Joshua, who is a picture of a believer. Zechariah 3, verse 1, he saw Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is a picture of Christ. It means messenger. And Satan standing there to accuse him. There it is. Do you see the picture there? This believer, Joshua. Satan standing there to accuse him. And Jesus standing there in front. And God says to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The so Lord has chosen this person as a brand plucked from the fire. And Joshua had sinned. It says in verse 3, He was clothed with filthy garments. So there was room for Satan to accuse him because there was sin in his life. But the advocate said, remove the filthy garments. Now applying that to New Testament, he's saying, because I've died for his sin, get rid of that sin. Remove the filthy garments. I've taken away your iniquity from you and I'm going to justify you. Clothe you with festal robes. That was the ministry of the intercessor. To cleanse him immediately, as soon as he was accused, justify him. Now, see the interesting ministry of Zechariah, who was a young man. Zechariah was a young man. You read that in chapter 2, verse 4. Young brother. 
he was standing there seeing this going on in the heavenlies, the accusation and Christ justifying that person. And he got so excited. He said, don't just put a festal robe on him, put a clean turban on his head as well. Verse 5. They put a clean turban on his head because Zachariah joined that ministry of intercession. Beautiful example of what a believer should do to glorify and justify God's children. There's something we can learn there. Satan roaming around the world looking for whom he can accuse. And when he stands before God, obviously he told people about many, many people like this and Job. And God says, yeah, all, right, all that you say is right about all those people, that fellow, that fellow, that fellow, all the thousands of people you mentioned. It's right, but Job 1.8. Satan, okay, you told me about all the hypocrites on earth who preach and don't live according to what they preach and all the hypocrites who go to religious services and say they are worshiping God and live deceptive lives. But have you seen Job? Job 1.8. Have you seen my servant Job? That there is no one like him on the whole earth. What a testimony. What a joy Job brought to God's heart. That in the midst of all the multitudes of hypocrites. He could find one witness. Who was true to him. God's had a witness in different generations. Noah in his time. Enoch in his time, who walked with God in the midst of an ungodly world. Prophets, Elijah, Elisha in their time. Jesus, when he walked on the earth, John the Baptist. What about today? He still looks for people here and there in different parts of the earth. Not perfect. Uh, he was a blameless man. Blameless is different from absolute perfection. Nobody is absolutely perfect. But blameless means according to the light they have they are perfect. And that's all God expects of you. According to the light you have got in your conscience by the Holy Spirit that you stay free from sin. He doesn't judge you by the light he has given to another brother who is ten times more mature than you are. He's judged by a higher standard. But you are judged only by the standard of your own conscience. That's the meaning of blameless and upright. And here's a man who fears me and turns away from evil. And Satan says, does Job fear God for nothing? <laughs> he fears you because you have done so many things for him. You have put, you have blessed him in so many ways. And here's an amazing thing you read in Job chapter 1 verse 10 which we don't know about in any other part of scripture and we would not have known about it if Satan had not accidentally let that slip out of his mouth that around God's children there's a threefold hedge. Did you know that? You know I would never have known that if Satan had not mentioned it here. There's some things I'm thankful for for what he says. One, there's a hedge around the child of God, around his body. It certainly applies to me as well because I'm new covenant. Job is not even in the old covenant. I'm a precious child of God. I'm the apple of his eye. And so are you if you have faith for it. If you don't believe the de devil's lie who tells you you're worthless and good for nothing. <laughs> I'm a sinner saved by grace but I'm, today I'm very precious in God's eyes. I believe that. And if you believe it, if you're born again, that's true of you as well. And if you're totally surrendered to Christ, there's a hedge around your body. Number one. There's a hedge around your children, your whole wife and children, your family. And there's a third hedge around your business and your property. Is God interested? In a believer's business and property? He certainly is. <laughs> I've proved that for many years in my life. There's this threefold hedge around God's children. 
and Satan cannot come through. But Satan says, no, you've done all this, God, so I can't touch him. What was he saying? He is uh, so faithful and all that because you've protected him like that. You don't let me touch his property. You don't let me touch his family. You don't let me touch his body. And you say he's faithful to you because you've protected him like this. And you've blessed the work of his hands, verse 10. You've blessed his possessions and you've increased the land. No wonder he's so good. But now, let me, let me ask you, God. Let me see whether he'll... Uh, still serve you if you put forth your hand and touch all that he has he will surely curse you to your face and the Lord said okay I give you permission that's a wonderful thing we learned there Satan cannot touch any one of these three areas without God's permission he cannot touch my business, my house, my assets. He cannot touch my family, my wife or children. He cannot touch my body without his first getting permission from God. That was true long before the old covenant. When Job lived here, it was true. And we read further that Satan went out and the rest of that chapter you see how he attacked the animals that was property those days wealth business were destroyed the wind came and struck the house in which all his children were and it fell on them and they all died verse 19 he lost all his property and it he gets that message one after the other Verse 16, while one fellow came and said that uh, you've lost all your oxen and donkeys and servants, another fellow came and said the fire of God fell from heaven and burnt up the sheep and the servants also. And while he was speaking, another person said in verse 17, the Chaldeans came and took away all the camels and killed their servants. And then while he was still speaking, a fourth fellow came and said your sons and daughters also died. It's all one after the other in the space of about one minute. He gets four messengers coming and telling him that he's lost everything. Now Job did not know then what he writes here now. I believe he wrote the book. But he writes that at the end of his experience when God revealed to him what had actually happened in the heavenlies. But today we know it. And that's a wonderful thing to know that when you lose something... I mean, if you're a wholehearted, dedicated child of God, when you lose something, when, you, when your family is attacked or you're attacked, it is always with God's permission. Unless you have opened yourself up to the devil in some area. That's another thing. For example, you keep a bitterness in your heart against somebody. That's like giving a foothold to the devil. You're inviting him to come in. God doesn't need to open up that hedge. You opened it up yourself. You don't have to. That's why we've got to be careful that we don't have a bitterness against anyone at any time. It's a wide open door for the devil. You join hands with him and sit at home accusing people. You're going to have problems, I'll tell you that. Because you hold hands with the devil, he, you've got to give him a foothold right there. Or you do something wrong and conceal it because you thank God that no man ever caught you. You open the door. There are a lot of preachers and others who have just opened the door to the devil like that. And especially if you're a hypocrite. See, God is very merciful to people who are struggling with sin. I'll tell you that. Are you struggling with sexual lust? God will be merciful to you if you're battling it. Have you got a problem with anger? God is tremendously merciful with you. I'll tell you one thing to your encouragement. As long as you're battling a sin, the devil can't get through to you. No. I say to you, even if you're battling it for 10 years, don't give up. Battle it, battle it. Whatever sin it is, you say, Lord, I'm battling it, I'm against it. Because when you battle it, you're saying to God, 
I am against this sin. But when you stop battling it, you're saying, oh, well, I accept it. That's why it's so important to keep battling against sin. The devil can't get through to you. Never give up. And as soon as you fall, confess immediately. Don't wait till the next day. You don't want to invite the devil into your home for one day if you have a tension with your wife. Why does the Bible say in Ephesians 4? Turn to Ephesians 4. It's a very important verse. I think it especially applies to husband and wife. Ephesians chapter 4, it says here in uh, verse 26. He says, if you're angry, don't commit sin. Ephesians 4, 26. The best thing is not to be angry at all in your home. But if you do happen to fall into it, don't sin. Don't let the sun set on your anger. In those days when they didn't have electricity, sunset was about the time people went to bed. So the meaning there, if I paraphrase it, don't go to bed without settling that tension with your husband or your wife. Never. Don't go to bed a single day of your life without doing that. It's in one of the most important exhortations that I give to married couples when I conduct a wedding. Don't ever go to bed without settling things that are there between you and your wife or husband. Because if you do, verse 27, you'll give the devil a foothold, an opportunity to enter your home. And you can suffer. Things can get worse. You have opened up a hedge there. God didn't open that. And your children can suffer. All types of people, all types of things can happen. I urge you in Jesus' name, the times of ignorance God overlooks. At least from today. Even if your partner does not have light on this. You have light on it. You do your part. Even if it's not your fault. Apologize. Humble yourself. And in every tension and conflict. At least one percent of the blame must be yours. <laughs> It can't be that 100% is the other parties. In every conflict that I've ever heard of, there's never been 100% of the blame on one side. There's only one conflict in history where there was 100% blame on one side, and that is the conflict between God and man. There the blame was 100% man's. But in every conflict between human beings, whether believer and believer, or elder brother and elder brother, or husband and wife, always some small percentage of the blame is with one partner. Acknowledge that. You're not telling a lie when you say, I'm sorry. Otherwise, you give the devil an opportunity. And here, of course, it wasn't like that. The devil came right in, killed all his children. And it says here, Job bowed down and worshiped God. And he made this amazing statement. The Lord gave, verse 21, and the Lord has every right to take away. He says, I came naked. When I came from my mother's womb, I didn't have any camels or donkeys or property or money or wife or children, nothing. I came with nothing. I didn't even have a stitch of clothing on me. Everything I have, including the clothes I wear, were given to me by God freely. I don't deserve it, but he gave it to me. And he who gave it to me has every right to take it away. Dear brothers and sisters, do you have that attitude? Do you recognize or do you feel that by the strength of your hand and the cleverness of your mind you achieved all this and uh, you know accumulated all this? Always say, Paul says that to Timothy, we brought nothing into this world and therefore we can take nothing out. I came into the world without anything Anything I have today is God's mercy and grace. I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, keep that attitude always. 
Unfortunately, Job could not maintain that attitude till the end. And that's why later on he started accusing God. In chapter 3 onwards, he's become a backslider. But what he, the, his attitude in the first two chapters is a wonderful example for us believers to follow. It says there that he bowed down and worshipped. That was a sacrifice of worship. There's worship which is easy, but to worship when you've lost everything. I've never heard of anyone in my life who suffered like this. Seven sons, three daughters, and all his property, everything gone in a few moments. And he bowed down and worshipped, and he was the greatest, I mean the most spiritual man of God on the face of the earth. And he did not sin, it says in verse 22, he didn't blame God. In the new covenant, many of us, we know the word. We've got the Holy Spirit. Do you blame God when something happens which you can't understand in your life? When you lose out financially? You say, Lord, I've been faithful. Maybe. Maybe you're the most upright man on the face of the earth. And you're just being tested. God's allowed the devil to, open, he's opened up a hedge for the devil to come through. Will you be found faithful? Will the devil, will God be able to say to the devil, like he said in verse 3 of chapter 2, have you seen how he holds fast his integrity, even though you incited me against him to ruin him without a cause? The latter part of verse 3. Can God say that about you? to the devil after the trial has come into your life when the devil comes like a roaring lion attacks you and your children and your business and your property and you bow and worship God why do we say that what Job could hold on to just for a few days we can hold on to forever because we have the Holy Spirit which he didn't have that's why we don't have to go into those dumps of discouragement and backsliding and accusing God that Job went to in chapter 3. He did not have the Holy Spirit. You cannot compare yourself with him. It says in Hebrews 11, after the great list of men of faith in the Old Testament, by faith so and so, so and so, and we could say by faith Job also worshipped God. But at the last verse of Hebrews 11 says, God has provided something better for us. Something better than Job. And the next verse it says, our faith, the author of our faith is Jesus. He would never complain, no matter what happened. He would forgive even those who crucified him. He would always say, the cup which my father has given me, shall I not drink it? That's the one we follow. Every situation. I don't look at Judas Iscariot. Peter looked at Judas Iscariot and took his sword and attacked. But Jesus said, put that sword back. The cup which my father has given me, Judas Iscariot was only the mailman who brought the cup. But I look at the address, it's from my father. It doesn't matter what the mailman looks like. <laughs> have you understood that? When you get a trial in your life, that there may have been a human instrument that caused that problem for you, but look at the address, sender's address, your heavenly father. <laughs> the cup of the Lord may be bitter, but there's no poison in it. The cup the devil offers is sweet but it's poisonous. And then the say, devil was not happy. He's, he's determined to accuse a man of God. He, I mean, he's determined to get at this man. That's not enough. Lord, uh, the Lord says that and Satan says, yeah, I know. <laughs> he's men of God. They really, ultimately, they love only themselves. They don't even love their families or their property. It's themselves. Touch him. <laughs> Touch his body and then let's see whether he continues like that. And then God removed the third hedge. Up till now it was only hedge one, property, hedge two, family. Hedge three. And he says, okay. But God said, you cannot take his life. There's a limit to how much I allow you to touch him. Remember that. You can give him a sickness, but you can't kill him. There's wonderful lessons we can learn in the very first book that God wrote for man. 
there's a limit to how much God will allow Satan. He will not allow us to be tested beyond our ability. But will with that temptation give us grace to overcome it and we'll become rich. And Satan went out and struck Job with boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Have you ever seen anybody like that? I've never seen anyone like that. With boils from the sole of his feet. And he can't even put his foot down. He can't sit. Everywhere, boils, boils to the crown of his head. And it's probably some type of leprosy or something because it says he had to sit outside the camp. And um, he scraped himself, feeling scratchy the whole time. And then <laughs> we see something interesting. When the second hedge was opened up, do you know who all were in that second hedge? His wife and ten children. Why did Job, why did Satan not kill his wife? He had permission. He said, that woman is more useful to me alive than dead. <laughs> I can, if I kill her, <laughs> I won't be able to nag Job, nag Job day and night. I'm going to not kill her. I'll keep her alive and make his life more miserable. Satan's wise. <laughs> he knows the nature of every wife, of every woman. He knows the ones he can use. If that woman was a godly woman, he would have killed her. He said, boy, she may encourage Job in the midst of his trials and he may come out of it. Ah, he says, I've seen her. I know all about her. She's a nag. I can use her. I won't kill her. I told the demons, don't touch her. She's on our side. <laughs> and, and you see that. <laughs> now, of course, none of you sisters are like that, okay? <laughs> I hope so. And his wife said to him, sure enough, you see, what are you doing, verse 9, chapter 2, verse 9, still holding fast to your integrity? Commit suicide! He's really on Satan's side. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. Curse God and commit suicide. That's what it means. How else can he die except by committing suicide? But what a man of God he is. Now, I'm not telling you to speak to your wife like this, but you should have this attitude. You speak as one of these foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? We don't speak like that because as Christians we have grace on our lips. But we must have that attitude even if your wife seeks to draw you away from faith in God. Job was before the old covenant so he could call his wife a foolish woman. We don't say that. But that attitude is right. I will not do that. We say, darling, I'm not going to do that. Don't say foolish woman. But <laughs> darling, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. God's been good to us in so many ways. Now he's taking us through a trial. We'll stick it out. And all this Job did not sin. And that wasn't the end of his trials. Satan had got some other people on his side. Those are three preachers. You know some preachers can be on the devil's side too? And they come to add to Job's problems. You know these preachers who come and tell you it's because you don't have faith that you're not healed. Or there was some sin in your life, you better confess it. That's why, that's exactly what these preachers do. See, I have a feeling that these preachers were a bit jealous. That Job was such a rich man and a spiritual man. Now, if he was a spiritual man and he was poor, they'd have been happy. Or if he was a rich man and ungodly, I'd say, yeah, he's good for nothing. But when somebody sees a man who is spiritual and also well off financially, Boy, it works out the jealousy of some believers. I want to ask you, are you in that category? That you see somebody is a really spiritual person and you're jealous because if he was poor and struggling to live, you'd have been happy. But you see that he's rich and well off. And that really works you up. And then God allows some sickness or trial to come into that brother's life and you are secretly happy. Aha. But of course you pretend to be concerned. 
and you go and say, brother, we're so sorry to hear that this has happened, but secretly you're a bit delighted because you never liked him. I don't think these preachers like Joe. And they came there and they pretended, oh, what a pretense, they were good actors. It says here they lifted up their voices and wept in verse 12. Now you can't do that easily unless you're a good actor. To really weep and act as though you are so concerned about him. But then when you see the way they're speaking to him in the subsequent chapters, you know, they just came there to accuse him and add to his miseries. You know, God is a great, uh, he's a master at exposing Pharisees. He uses a woman caught in adultery to expose Pharisees. <laughs> Isn't that great? You wouldn't think that God could use a woman caught in adultery for anything, but he did. To expose the Pharisees of some, Phariseeism of some self-righteous people. He used the sufferings of a godly man, Job, to expose certain preachers as Pharisees who were ready to criticize, find fault, not give one word of encouragement, not give him hope, but immediately say, yeah, yeah, I know why this has happened. They didn't know. They judged by the sight of their eyes and by the hearing of their ears. And I've seen it happen many a time. God allows a man of God to suffer in some way. And he allows other believers to hear about it or see it. And they make comments. And those comments expose the fact that they are in league with the devil. It was not exposed till then. Till then everybody thought they were holy men, good believers. But God has a way of bringing out those hidden wrong attitudes by making one of his godly children, maybe the godliest man in town, suffer. His children die or something happens. There all the critics are there to find fault. See, we know this thing was wrong, that thing was wrong. Oh, I've seen so many cases of that like that from believers. And I'll tell you something. The unbelievers, they are really sorry when they see people suffer. They are compassionate. It's the believers who are critical. I've seen that in numerous cases. Examine your own heart. And see if you fall in the category of Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, who pretend with loud manufactured tears that they are sorry for Job, but deep down in their heart they are critical. They've got their sermons ready to accuse him. And at the end of it, the book of Job, God says to the three of you, you people are evil. Go and ask Job to forgive you. That's what he says. Because Job must pray for you. Otherwise I will punish you. So Satan's got his agents everywhere and we learn from this the many ways in which Satan comes to attack. We are not ignorant of his schemes and when these modern day Bildads and Zophars and all come to us bless them that curse you. Love your enemies. Let them say what they like. If they want to hold hands with the devil, let them do it. You make sure that you don't hold hands with the devil, either like Job's wife or like those preachers. In most cases, we have to say, I don't know why this happened, brother, but I'm not the judge. I want to pray for you sincerely. I'm on the side of Jesus, the intercessor. And if you take that position, you'll always be right. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads before God in prayer.